so uh, the topic today is uh, is uh, surrounding training load, and um, uh, I chose the catchy title if it's uh, not as easy as we first thought. But uh, I think we can see that most of it should be fairly simple either way. Uh, this is the agenda today, uh, and the first topic will be surrounding just what training load really is. And training load, to put it really simply, is just all the stimulus you get from physical activity. And that could be going up a flight of stairs to your office in the morning. It could be going to the gym, lifting weights, or it could be performing uh, actions in training or match play in football. So even though it seems sometimes rather complicated, it's, it really is fairly easy. And when working with training load, there are three different processes that we do. So the first is monitoring. And uh, when we monitor, that's when we capture our data. And the data we capture can be divided into two groups. The external load, which is the physical output that they actually perform during the course of a session and the internal load, which is the response the athlete has had to the physical output. So if a athlete has run for five kilometers during a football session, then we can ask the athlete afterwards how hard it was uh, on a scale from one to 10, such as the RPE scale, then the five kilometers would be the external training load and the RPE scale would be the internal. And the second step is load analysis and load analysis is where we make our raw data into tangible insights for decision making and analysis is the main emphasis of this talk in this talk but before we head on uh, the last part is management and that's where we use the raw data to actually make decisions and train load management sounds rather fancy but in real life, it's just training load management. OK, so further into training load analysis. There are several concepts when it comes to training load, but the most basic is absolute load. Absolute load is just uh, the total amount of what you've done. Next concept is relative load. And relative load is the absolute load but when you have applied a context to it. The context could be game demand. When we look at the weekly distance then, we, uh, we see it in light of the game demand and we calculate it as percentage of the game demand. So that a week's distance could be uh, 25 uh, miles uh, of running or it could be two and a half times uh, the game demand. The next context we can apply is the load history, which enables us to see the weekly distance in light of uh, what we've done in previous weeks so that we can see that weekly distance. OK, that was a 200% change from the week before. So absolute load is, to put it simply, just a total amount of what the athlete has performed it could be put just simply like this, or it can be the cumulative distance from one week to another. And the last part is also to do a, a kind of average. But it doesn't have to be a week. So in the literature, we have seen a lot of examples of different time periods. And the sh typically shorter period is called the acute load. And that can range from three days up until 10, most typically seven days. And we have the chronic load, which is just a longer time period. And this has to be obviously more than 10 days to separate from the acute load. It could be actually several months if you want that. But the most typically is 21 or 28 days, three or four weeks. If we apply the game demand context, to get the relative load, things can look a bit different than the absolute load. And to show this, I'll use a training as an example. So this is the total distance from a football training we had last year. 
try to look at the difference of these two players. The player on the left has run for 6.2 kilometers, whereas the player on the right has run for 5.4, meaning a 15% more, uh, uh, more distance covered from that person to the left. But when we apply the game demand context and we uh, see how much this is relative to their individual game demand, we can actually see that the player on the right has a higher percentage of his game demand. And if we, if we analyze this in this way, we can see the player on the left has actually run 8% less. So it's important to keep both thoughts in mind at the same time. Another point is when we use game demand, we have to remember that it's not distributed equally to a game. So if you use 500 meters of sprinting in the game as an example, we can use this graph. Um, on the x-axis, we have every minute of the game. And on the y-axis, we have the meters amount, uh, the, the distance sprinted in each minute. So if we take 500 and spread it out equally, it will look like this, meaning 5.5 meters per minute in every minute of the game. That not, that's not a... Um, likely scenario to happen and no football match really looks like this rather it looks more or less like this in where a lot of minutes of the game actually most there are no sprinting but there are some periods where there are very intense actions and such as in this last uh, period uh, the demand in that particular minute is not 5.5 meters, but it's 60 meters. And what's also peculiar is that in these moments, these are the moments that often decide the games. So the reason that you have to really do the sprinting for 60 meters is that you have to either defend your goal or have you have to do everything you can to, to score an equalizer or to get ahead. So the, uh, the, the periods where the demands are highest can also be really difficult to, to, to train, but it's also really important to analyze the peak demands of the game. So when we are doing training planning, it's not enough to just think of the average demands, but we also have to have the peak demands in mind. Okay, so the last but final and probably the most important concept of uh, training load is when we apply the load history as a context. So the relative load then goes from the game demand, but over to the load history, and we will analyze load as a change in load. So we can either do it as a week to week this difference uh, as percentages or absolute values, uh, so that from week one to week two, we can either see that there is a 100% increase or there is a 200 meters increase uh, or we can do it in a more uh, advanced way so the graph from before where we had the acute and chronic loads uh, analyzed separately that was with absolute load but when we divide the acute load to the chronic load we get the, the now infamous concept of acute chronic workload ratio and this concept uh, will be uh, highlighted a bit further in the next uh, chapter. So next point is what's the relationship between load and injury? And to answer this question, uh, we need to do, um, uh, pose a new question, which is what's the evidence? And just to make it clear, I have limited the scope of this lecture to only include the ACVR acute chronic workload ratio studies. Hello, and Mr. good morning. When reviewing the evidence What's of up? ACVR, uh, we need to use the evidence pyramid. And we can see that actually a lot of the studies have been within the last bracket, the expert opinions. And that being uh, posts on social media, such as Twitter or YouTube, but there are also a lot of editorials and discussion pieces 
in the peer-reviewed literature. Besides these expert opinions, there are a lot of level two evidence core studies. And when evaluating the quality of these um, and reviewing uh, what they found, I have included 46 studies, and out of the 46, 40 of them had reported associations, positive associations between acute chronic workload ratio and injuries. None of them were able to have a to predict injuries based on ACVR, and all 46 had a methodological weakness in some way. And the methodological weakness could be the groups of methodological weaknesses could be divided into three. And the first thing was surrounding how training load and health problems was recorded. So everyone that's been working or have even heard of GPS tracking in sports is probably aware that there is a plethora of different variables you get out. So you can have as many variables from a GPS system as you like, basically. And also in literature, there are a lot of different um, variables used from, from the GPS and accelerometer-based devices. Furthermore, there have been differences in which system used. Systems have different cutoff values, such as sprinting is in one case defined as uh, all, uh, all distance above 24.8 kilometers per hour, whereas in other articles of system, it, this could be slightly different, different. Also the dwell time, which is a technical term in the GPS world, uh, can differ, which means that the result from one study to another can be considerably different. Also when using the internal load, there are differences, although most articles have actually used a session RP method, although there are some differences in how they have recorded it and the questionnaire that is used. Next is a large difference in which health problem definition that is used. More than 90% of the studies has used time loss, meaning they are not likely to have capture all the overuse injuries. There is also a discussion going on whether contact injuries should be included or not. And some studies have included it and some studies have not. And the last part, which is a really difficult discussion, is whether to include illnesses. So in some cases, people have included illness as a health problem, whereas most studies have only analyzed uh, the injuries. Next point, and, is, and a really important point, is whether the injuries are registered directly from the athletes or if it's the staff that has include, uh, uh, registered the athletes. And if it's the uh, staff, how uh, research vested are they? Uh, which is a, also a really important point proven by Erik uh, Halvorsenvik at, at, at uh, Hospital. So the next group of um, problems is how ACVR has been calculated. So even though it's, it, the, the metric itself is really simple, you divide one number to the, to the other, then you have the ratio, but there is actually a lot of things you can change. So the first thing you can differ is how many days. So the acute load has in some cases been three, some cases it has been nine, but the most usually seven days. And for the chronic period, it has been everything from, I think, 12 to 30 something, although the most common thing is to follow the, uh, the weeks, so either two, three or four weeks. The most common combination is seven days to 28 days. To complicate things a bit further, you can either use just a flat rolling average, which we know from everyday calculus, or what's been uh, rather popular lately is to use the exponentially weighted moving average, which then weights the values that are more recent in time. Last but not least, there is something called a coupling, which means that in the original concept, the acute week is a part of both the acute load 
but it's also 25% of the chronic load if you use a 28-day chronic period. And this leads to some problems, uh, as such as a, a, a correlation, a spurious correlation between uh, the two. Uh, whether this matters a lot, a lot or not is, 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 is a bit unclear, but research coming out of uh, Qatar and Aspetar from Lovely uh, et al. Uh, suggests that this is a, a large problem. Although uh, there are a lot of studies that have also analyzed it as separately, meaning that the acute week, here defined as week one, is the acute load, whereas the chronic load then goes from week two through five. And the, the, the last part, and probably the most important part, is how the relationship between ACVR and health problem has been analyzed. So let's say that what we, this is just a summary of what we've talked about so far. Let's say that we have decided on all of, on all of this. So we chose the session RPE as load parameter. We had a 7 to 28 days rolling average, and we chose a couple ACVR. OK, so far, so good. Then we can make a, an, a ratio. But after making the ratio, the first thing you have to choose is to analyze it against injury on a continuous way or a categorical way. If you choose the continuous path, you have to choose a method, which is at the moment uh, not uh, having reached a consensus on. But if you then go with the categorical way, which almost every study has, then you have some choices to make. So the first thing is how to define your categories. So let's say that we have an athlete that's had an injury, and the injury happened when the athlete had a ACVR at 1.7. If you have used a predefined cutoff value for the categories, meaning that you uh, stick with the, the original concept, stating that 1.5 is the danger zone and everything above that is a high ACVR, then the 1.7 bit would be considered high, as high. But almost half or even more than half of the studies have used a distribution-based category system. And what happens then is typically the, the categories are a lot wider, meaning that this uh, entry at 1.7 is with a distribution-based category medium. So if you try to analyze this entry using predefined or distribution-based cutoff values, then you will have two rather different values, results. Next, next uh, choice you have to make is how many categories you choose. So you can have three, high, medium, and low, then you can, then you have to decide which a comparison to do. And that's rather easy with three. If you have five, which is quite common, then you have a lot more options. And it gets rather messy when you have uh, five, five categories that has to be compared to each other. So it's not that simple. So after choosing which categories to compare, how many, and how to divide them, you have you're through with the, this choice. The next choice is to decide whether to do something with the missing data. You can do something, then you have to know which method, also no consensus, or you can do nothing. You can address the latency, meaning you have some lag time after the entry. You can do nothing, you can do something. If you do something, how many days? Also no consensus. Which statistical approach should you use with which method? There are a lot of different options. There are no gold, gold standard at the moment. And last but not least, which health problem definition do you use? We have the three most common ones, but then also you have to consider, should you include contact injuries? And should you include illnesses? So if you add up these, all these alternatives, and keep in mind that there are a lot of different alternatives within different choice, we have a possible amount of permutations or combinations that is well above 51 million. So in other words, there are a lot of decisions you have to make. This is the methods used by all of the 46 studies that I have included. 
And what's apparent by only looking at the table is that in some columns, there are some uh, heterogeneity, such as in the coupling, where almost every study has used a coupled approach. But where it's rather different is, such as in this column, of statistical methods, where uh, only a few have used the same. And actually, when you analyze all of this, you can find that no study has used the exact same combination. Then the question would be, does this really matter? And that was the question we asked um, before making um, a, a cohort study ourselves. So we recruited 86 of the best elite youth players in Norway for 105 days of daily training load and entry registration, where we used a change in state, all complaints, entry recording method, and the session RP as the load parameter. We recorded six and a half thousand training days, almost 200 health problems, 90 entries, and 46 new non-contact entries. And the results were like this. An increased ACVR led to an increased health problem risk. And that could be my end of talk if I've taken the, the short route. But it's not that simple. So what we did, did in this study was that we chose both coupled and uncoupled. We chose a seven-day acute period, which was both with rolling average and exponentially weighted moving average. We had the chronic period of 21 and 28 days, both averages. We analyzed this as categorical, predefined, and distribution-based three categories, this combination, no imputation, no latency. We have the random effect logistic regression model, and we have three different health problem definitions. In total, 108 combinations. So what's this? these are all the relationships between the different ACVR combinations and health problems. So what's really apparent is that if you want you can find associations that are significant and you can present it in the way that I just did. If we count it up, there are 21 positive results. And again, if you only present the 21 positive results, that looks rather positive for the ACVR concept. But when you review all the evidence, which is also including the analysis that is not significant, the ones that are not involved, we can see that there is actually 87 of them that's not significant. Meaning that which method, uh, which method you use for it really matters. And to complicate it further, there are more problems. This is a problem highlighted recently by Franco in Pelliceri, um, and this is a, a cycle of uh, re, uh, questionable research practices. And he has linked it, and I have linked it in this talk, to training load and injuries. So the first one is generate and specify hypothesis, and there is a failure to control for bias. And the reason we have that in training load research is there is no sound conceptual framework linking training load to injuries. When it comes to design studies and low statistical powers, power, we know that the median of number of incidences is actually 72 in these 46 studies, which is um, probably too low to make meaningful conclusions. For quality control, we know that we struggle with low compliance and missing data. Problems with uh, p-hacking, interpreting of results, and harking is also prevalent, and that's due to the number, the large number of analysis performed, number of combinations that is possible, and also highly biased conclusions where authors have chosen the positive results to focus on. The last part is the publication bias, which is also really apparent in this field as all over 90% are positive findings. Okay. So moving over to whether it can it can prevent injuries. Again, what's the evidence? So let's say that all of these studies was 
perfectly executed, no problems at all. And everyone showed a, a really uh, positive way for the ACVR. The problem with them then would be that they, these are only observational studies and observational studies are not suited to be proved for a preventive effect. In order to actually show the preventive effect, you would need a experimental design. And in our field, that would mean a, an, a randomized control trial. And that is what we did in 2018. So we spent a whole season from February to November, where both groups registered their prevalence of health problems. Whereas the intervention group obviously also then got the intervention. And the intervention consisted of tutoring of the coaches. And the, the load management was based on the original ACVR paper, Hulin et al. from 2014, as well as the IOC consensus statement describing the sweet spot concept, which we know from this now infamous graph uh, is from 0 0.8 uh, up until 1.3 and then the danger zone, uh, which is from 1.5 and up. So we advise the coaches that they should have the athlete within this sweet spot and try not to exceed the danger zone uh, cutoff, which was 1.5. We used uh, the most standard way to of calculating it, which was seven to eight days coupled rolling average. As a load parameter, we had the session RP, which is duration times exertion of a session. And the way the athletes reported this was by a smartphone application where they had their, their training program. Um, they had to press what they've just done, assign a RPE score to this, and then just press OK. And immediately after this is done, the coaches got their results in a athlete management system, which was in a uh, software uh, within the browser of each, each coach's uh, laptop. Then the coach had to plan the training week for each individual athlete. So first he had to choose the duration and then the expected RPE score. So how long it will last and how hard it will be. Then he chose the days that this activity would be, and then each athlete would have their own training plan. And that's regardless if, of whether they're training in school or only with the team or, or is participating also in the, in the national team. After assigning each athlete to uh, training sessions and expected training load within these training sessions and having the uh, the athletes' recent training load within the system, the coach had then a traffic light dashboard system. So if we focus on the right-hand side uh, of the load next week, we can see that the bottom half of the athletes actually have uh, are in the green zone with a expected ratio of 1.23, whereas the upper half is at uh, are in the red zone with an expected ratio of 1.68. And even though they are planned the same amount, this the reason is that the training load for the upper half is, is in the, their training load history is then lower and than the lower half. And when pressing such as this, this athlete, player number 10, the coach then would get a a message from the system stating that this had to this athlete had to decrease the load by this and this amount of training load units. Over to the health problem registration. So athletes they uh, responded to the OSTRC questionnaire health problems once per month. They got a text message on their phone which they opened include uh, enabling them to answer the survey on uh, their internet browser on their phone. And for those who are not known with this system, uh, the OSTRC questionnaire consists of four different questions uh, of 
uh, questions surrounding participation, training volume, performance, and symptoms. And the first question is regarding participation. And what's, what's uh, similar for all of these questions is that if you answer alternative one, which is either full participation, no reduction, or no symptoms, if you answer alternative one, then you're all clear. Then you have uh, no problems at all. You have not been hampered at all with the performance or training volume, and then you would be considered to be having uh, to not having a health problem. Whereas if you press anything but alternative one in either of the brackets, such as minor extent uh, problem with performance due to health problem, you would be considered to have a health problem, which is also the primary outcome of the study. If you were to have a moderate uh, problem or higher within the training volume or the performance question, you would be then considered to be having a substantial health problem, which is the secondary outcome in this study. Or to recruitment. So we had 36 teams that agreed to participate uh, during and after the randomization pro process, 11 teams withdrew, making us left with 25 teams, 11 in the intervention group, 14 in the control group. We removed all non-responders to the study and we ended up with 394 players across the two groups. The participants were the best elite youth players in Norway from both genders. Over to the results. We had a 65% uh, percent, uh, compliance for the health problem uh, survey and for uh, the adherence to the intervention, we asked the coaches in a post-study questionnaire, did you use the program as intended every week of the season where 62.5% of the coaches replied yes, where and 12 said every other week where and 25 said once per month. And this is the graph showing all health problems. Gray is the control group, and uh, the bold line is the intervention group. So there is no difference across a whole season, and we saw no effect of the intervention on all health problems. For substantial health problems, we saw a similar result where there were although a slight uh, visual difference, but no real difference when analyzed of the intervention. The limitations of the study, one of them was the measure of adherence to the intervention. We wish that we would have had a more sound uh, measure, uh, which we could quantify from every week. We used the same threshold and approach for all athletes. Uh, whereas in real life, it really looks like you have to have different thresholds. And last but not least, if the question, research question was to see whether training load and injuries are connected or can be prevented through training load, then in hindsight, ACVR should not be used as ACVR is a really flawed method. But if the research question was to see whether ACVR could prevent injuries, that was obviously the correct way to do it and uh, might also be a strength to the study. Okay, um, final part. What about performance and what's the practical implications of these findings? So can load management prevent injuries? Probably not. Probably not when you use the same approach for all and probably not with ACVR in general. And the reason for this is probably the multifactorial nature of health problems. So problems can be completely random sometimes. It can be tackled, you could have some other problems impossible to control for, which makes it really difficult to prevent injuries in this way. It seems that at the point, training load management to prevent injuries and increase performance 
at the moment is more an art than a science. So in a professional setting, in a professional club or national team where you have a lot of staff, I think to prevent injuries using training load management actually is possible, but then you need a lot of staff to make individual thresholds and decisions for each individual athlete every single day. So by talking to the player, observing the player, talking to the coaches, uh, analyzing a lot of data uh, and breaking it down, then you, there's a balance, balancing act of load management for each indiv individual athlete. And I think uh, that would be a way uh, training load can actually prevent injuries. But for all that has no large staff group that can do all of this, I think uh, the answer at the moment is uh, sadly no. So does that mean we have to throw the baby out with the bathwater? And the baby in this case is training load management. So I think we should not abandon it. And the uh, conclusions from the RCT was also that the lack of a clear re relationship does not mean that practitioners should ab abandon load management. Uh, that the primary role has always been performance enhancement and not health problem prediction or prevention. So it should not be abandoned. And with the lack of sound models linking it, you, we should fall back to the training principles, such as the principle of progressive overload. And if we take a step back and look at the rationale for load management, it's really that you give the uh, body and mind time to adapt. And by doing so, we get less fatigue. So by doing correct load management or training planning, which is also is, we have more players coming into training with a full tank uh, rather than coming in fatigued. And whether this can prevent injuries really depends. And there are, the uh, answer to this is probably not at the moment. But whether it can increase performance is to me a more interesting uh, discussion and it's uh, really difficult to answer because the research uh, is very very difficult to conduct as performance is even more multifactorial than injuries. I think um, one model that has tried to link this to performance is this one from Franco and Pulisere where we start with performance we make the performance determinants to make training goals we make exercise based on this. Then we uh, monitor the external training load to see the physical output. We monitor the internal training load to see the individual adaptations to this. Then we have the training outcomes. Then we can see if the training outcomes has uh, reached the training goals. And if they have, then we might have increased our performance. For a more uh, thorough discussion on what training load should be used to, uh, I guide you to this recent editorial from Stephen West uh, and uh, a group of authors, including myself, that have outlined different use, uh, different things it should be used for and different aspects it should not be used for. And we divided it into five different brackets, the long-term use, in-season planning, day-to-day -day planning, in session adjustment as well as feedback and we have different points on the different uh, steps of the pyramid so i guide you to this article it's uh, uh, open access in the international journal of sports medicine so i think we should absolutely continue to to assess the athlete's training load but we have to do it for the right reasons and know the limitations, not least. So to conclude, what training load management should be used for is planning and control of training to inform training process decisions. And it should be used not in isolation, but in, uh, in togetherness with a lot of other factors. What it should not be used for is injury prediction and it should not be used as the holy grail of injury prevention as it's uh, not.